Okay, so good morning. Um, we would like to thank the organizers for uh, allowing us to ruin your minds from discussing these theoretical concepts, beautiful theoretical concepts about real life. We're going to go today through several cryptanalytic techniques. This is not even the beginning of the journey. Um, so I'm going to start with describing to you a real block cipher, the first publicly available block cipher, the data encryption standard. Then I'm going to discuss a bit the practical aspects of exhaustive key search, the basic cryptanalytic attack against block ciphers. Uh, again, uh, we'll discuss time memory trade-off attacks. You will see that later it's a wonderful and amazing concept that I have now. We'll continue to discuss meet in the middle attacks and several new results. Um, now, I have to apologize in advance. Today is going to be very, very condensed. And we were asked to give a glimpse of cryptanalysis uh, in one day. We had lots of arguments what should go in and what should go, should go out. There is a good chance that at the end of the day you will have some uh, brain freeze. We are terribly sorry for that. And after all the disclaimers, let's start. So block ciphers are one of the basic uh, cryptographic block uh, primitives. You use them everywhere. And generally speaking, you saw them as pseudorandom permutations, or more precisely, as a family of pseudorandom permutations. They take blocks of n bits, a key of k bits, and produce n bits and I would use either notations, and once you fix the key, this is a permutation. You need the ability to invert, and <coughs> block ciphers can encrypt exactly n bits of data. If you want to encrypt more data or less data, tough luck, there is modes of operations, uh, domain extensions, uh, various names to the same thing, how to deal with something which is not a multiple of a block size. Uh, this is not going to be the main con uh, topic of this day, though there will be some. So, the data encryption standard was introduced in the middle of the 70s, the NSA, and this is the time you should go NSA. So, the NSA, rumble, rumble, okay. <laughs> it's too early for you too as well. Uh, approached IBM and asked for a block software that will be used in the civil war, in the industry, in banking. IBM designed something, the NSA told them, <coughs> no, this is not how you design block ciphers. They fixed several things, and at the end we resulted with the data encryption standard. It is a face of block cipher, in a second you will see what that means. It has 64-bit block, meaning that each time you encrypt 64 bits, each call to the function you get 64 bits of pseudo-randomness. The key is 56 bits long, and there are 16 rounds, and we will see it in a second. And the run function itself accepts 32 bits from the data path and 48 bits of the sub key. So in a second, you will see that you start with a plain text. This is the initial permutation. It just takes 64 bits, puts 32 bits here, 32 bits here. It has no cryptographic value whatsoever. It is public function, public permutation, just shuffling bits from one place to the other. So if I give you the value here, you can compute backwards. If I give you the value here, you can compute forwards. No key involved. It's there for electrical engineering reasons. I'm going to disregard this permutation starting from this point, but when you look at the standard, you will see the initial permutation there. 32 bits here, 32 bits here. 32 bits go into the F function, into the round function, <laughs> along with 48 bits up key, and the output is XOR to the left half. So this is one round of a phase construction. You just swap the two halves, again, 32 bits, 48 bits subkey, a different subkey goes into the round function, you XOR, swap. Repeat this 16 times, and at the end there is the final permutation, again, just putting some bits in different locations. No cryptographic value whatsoever. Um, Question so far. What is this new for some? Yeah, sorry. What was the reason for this swapping the bits? Um, left and right, so you want to make sure that each half affects the other. The end and the beginning, this insignificant computation. Electrical engineering reasons. You move bits from one place to the other because it's easier to represent them this way. 
but I have to admit the desk criteria were never really released. We just reverse engineered. So we're guessing. Yes. Okay, so there is a key schedule algorithm that takes 56 bits of the key and generates 16, K1 to K16, values of 48 bits each. I will show you the key schedule afterwards. Um, the key itself is supposed to be chosen at random. So why do you say it's uh, engineering of no... Ah, no, the, the, the reason for moving bits from one side to the other. This is a fixed permutation, it has no cryptographic value whatsoever. Here are the initial permutation and final permutation. Not very interesting, besides the fact that one is the inverse of the other. And here is the round function. You take a 32-bit input, let's call it the right half, you send it through an expansion function. The expansion function takes 32 bits and duplicates them into 48. Yep. Now the NSA will not know how this works. <laughs> so, 32 bits become 48. 16 bits are just duplicated. The easiest way to transform 32 bits into 46, 48. Um, 16 bits are duplicated to be twice, and 16 bits just go as is. Now, after the expansion, we have 48 bits here, we have 48 bits here. We can XOR them together to get the value here, which is then divided into eight groups of six bits each. <coughs> we try to keep track on the numbers that are very important, very, very important. If you miss me here, it's okay. Eight S boxes each accepts six bits of input, produces four bits of output. The S boxes themselves are the nonlinear uh, component of the block cipher, of the ES. Um, I guess everybody are aware to the fact that trying to build pseudo-random permutations using only linear components is a bad idea, right? Just waiting for a few minutes. If you use only linear components, you're not going to get a secure pseudo-random permutation. So this is the non-linear part of the block cipher. So I had eight S-boxes. Each of them produces four bits of output. So we're going to get here 32 bits. These 32 bits are going to be shuffled between their locations using the P permutation. So it's not a permutation as in random permutation, it's a permutation that's just moving bits from one place to the other. And then the output is XORed into the left half and they are swapped. 16 times. Now just to prove to you that this is not a secret design, here is the expansion function. You can see that bit number one is uh, used at position 2 and position 48. <coughs> bit number 2 is used at position 3, 3 is used here, 4 is used here and here, 5 is here. And you will see very clearly that each S-box shares two bits with the next, with the previous S-box, uh, and two bits with the next S-box. This is actually a design uh, feature, and it causes some trouble to differential bit analysis. <coughs> Here is the P permutation, and again, if you look very carefully, you will find out that the output of one S-box, any one S-box that you will pick, will necessarily affect six S-boxes in the next round, meaning bit number one, the output of S-box S1, goes to this location, which is bit number nine. In the next round, bit number nine is going to affect S2 and S3. Bit number 2 becomes bit number 17, which will going, is going to affect these two S-boxes in the next round, and bits 3 and 4 affect only a single S-box. And this works for every S-box that you will pick. You will affect six S-boxes in the next round. Looks like fun, right? We've seen all of them. Here are the S-boxes. Now, I have to mention two things, which I haven't mentioned. Uh, those of you who are used to read these specs and started looking at throughout the AES competition, you will find out two interesting things. First of all, there is no zero in the table. And second of all, there is 32. And when you work with 32-bit numbers, 32-bit registers, we are used to the most significant bit being uh, 31 and the least significant being bit zero. However, this was designed by electrical engineers and given as a standard for electrical engineers, 
Everything is in big endian notation. Meaning, bit 1 is the most significant bit, bit 32 is the least significant bit. And here the S-loop says, if you give me an input of 0 to S1, the output is going to be... This is an interactive talk. Let's try again. Input is 0, the output is... Great. The input is 1, the output is going to be... Let's try again. The output is going to be... Zero. I will show you in a second how to read the tables. Don't worry. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, etc. But these are the S boxes. You can see, I'm not going to show you uh, explicitly, but each row is actually a permutation over zero to 15. And there are four such permutations that generate an S box. Now, the reason I'm giving you this in this weird notation is because you're following the FIPS, the standard. And the standard says, take the first bit and the last bit that enter the S-box. They are used to control which row you're going to access. The four middle bits select the column. So it's a weird system. If you don't want to start looking at bits, here is the index. 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 31, 32, 33, uh, 32, 33, etc. So these are the S-boxes. Everybody know how this works, right? Now we can all go and implement it and enjoy the... <coughs> I'm missing one part, which is the key schedule. You take a 64-bit key, um, and you produce from it 16... 48-bit subkeys, and I'm waiting for a complaint. But nobody complains. I told you that the key is 56 bits, and now I'm telling you, you take 64 bits. Again, this is historical reason. The key is defined to be 64 bits. However, each byte contains one parity bit. So if you read the standard, the standard says you take 64-bit key such that each byte contains one bit of parity, meaning that actually there are only 56 bits of entropy in this 64-bit string. So for any practical purpose, we're discussing 56-bit string. 28 goes to register C, 28 go to register D, two registers, C and D. And the following process is repeated. You rotate to the left one register, and the second one, and then you pick 24 bits out of this 28, 24 from this 28, and they compose the 48-bit subkey. You rotate to the left again, take 24 bits from here, 24 bits from here, 48 bits, and then you rotate left by 2, rotate left by 2, and in most of the rounds you rotate left by 2, in some of the rounds you rotate left by 1. Now, to make life even a bit harder, the first 24 bits actually go to affect the first four S-boxes, S1, S2, S3, and S4. The other 24 bits go to S5 to S8. <coughs> now, can somebody tell me the sum of all these rotation constants? 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1. 24 divided by 1. 28. Do you know why it's, the sum is 28? It's suspicious that the length of the register is 28 and the sum is 28. Exactly. It's ready for the next round of encryption. If I need to encrypt twice, I load the key once, and after finishing a full encryption, the registers C and D have completed a full cycle, meaning that they are ready for encryption again. It's the small engineering things which make life easy for all of us. Okay. Any questions? Good. So, um, now that you all know this, we can put this aside. I will take, it will take some time to absorb this. And now we're going to discuss generic attacks. I'm going to completely disregard everything that I just told you, how this works and that sort of stuff and I'm going to attack a generic block cipher. 
A block cipher whose design is unknown to me, or it's given to me, but I don't need to know it in advance. And these techniques always work independent of the cipher, independent of everything. The only thing that matters is the key length and the block length. These are the two things which matter. So, and I know that you like functions, so here is a problem. I'm giving you a random function from 1 to n, from this domain to this domain. And this is a random function. Now I'm giving you the following challenge. Here is y. y is f of x. You don't know x, but I'm giving you y. Can you please find me n x, one of the x's that satisfy f of x is equal to y? If this was a quadratic equation, well, we can solve quadratic equations. But this is a random function. So there are several techniques that you can naturally think of. The first of them is actually trying all the various x's. You take x1, you compute f of x1, you check whether it's equal to y, x2, f of x2, plus y, and you just go over all possible x's. Now you can tell me, you can ask, okay, so we have this function, and what's the relation from what we just suffered through this? And you sat here, you didn't complain too much. Why are you bothering us with that? So the thing is that if you have, if you define the function to be f of k being the encryption under the key k of some predetermined plaintext p, this is exactly the problem of trying to break a crypto system and giving you the plaintext, which is predetermined, and giving you the ciphertext, which is f of k, and I'm asking you, what is the key that connects these two things? This is what we're after. Most of the time, there are attacks, there are cryptanalytic attacks where, when we are not after the key. But generally speaking, we are going to try and find the key as efficiently as possible. And this is, to, this is the way to look at it as uh, a function, as a problem in functions, and not cryptanalytic problem. But at the end, we're going to try one key after the other until we find the correct key. So this is exhaustive search. You take the first key, you take the second key, you take the third key, you go over all possible keys until you hit the correct key. There is a second attack. It is sometimes called the table attack, dictionary attack. It has several names. The idea is as follows. You once go over all the possible inputs. And for each input you compute f of i. And you store in a table f of i and i. And now when I approach you and I tell you, please, invert the function on this specific y, you go to the table, you look at the entry which corresponds to y, and you find the image, the pre-image. Now, a very simple analysis shows that if you have n possible keys, n possible values, exhaustive search will take no pre-computation, no memory. Actually, you need one memory cell to store the values that you work with, but <coughs> generally speaking, one cell of memory, and the time complexity is going to be n. For the table attack, the pure computation is n, the memory is n, and the time complexity, the only time complexity is a single memory access. And if you implement using hash tables and that sort of stuff, it's really one memory access. Okay. Any questions? <coughs> Some ways to improve exhaustive search. You saw that you cannot improve on this basic attack. So there are several techniques that you can do. First of all, if I'm giving you number of machines, just assign the search space, divide the search space between the machines. The first machine tries this search space, this machine tries this part of the search space. One of them will find the key. Now, it doesn't reduce the overall complexity of the attack, but it does reduce the actual time that I have to wait for the key. And it's, I think it's very easy to see that you can parallelize it as efficiently as you like. You have 1,000 machines, just divide it by 1,000. Now, in some cases, you can take f and evaluate simultaneously f of i, f of i plus 1, f of i plus 2, f of i plus 3, at a much lower cost than evaluating four times the value of f. 
So this one of these techniques, for example, is called bit slicing, but there are other techniques where you just try to evaluate f multiple times, and it becomes cheaper than evaluating it one after the other. So if you do this thing, the number of times that you evaluated f remains n, but the real time that you spent, or the real effort, has reduced. Um, and, and again, I want to stress out that all of these techniques do not change the asymptotics. They just reduce the actual time of evaluating f, the amortized time to evaluate one single f. Other techniques that we use is, for example, partial evaluation. Let's say you're doing exhaustive search on this, and this is not the way to do exhaustive search, but it's just the concept. And assume that after 15 rounds, I'm even giving you the plain text, the cipher text, you try all possible keys, and after 15 rounds, you found out the value here does not correspond to the cipher text. No matter what will happen here in the 16th round, the encryption under this key will not reach the, plain text, the correct cipher text. Is there a point in evaluating the 16th round? No. So we can do early abort. So again, we save a bit uh, on the actual time spent. <coughs> and finally, I have to mention that people are actually using uh, other technologies rather than just CPUs. Uh, for example, FPGAs or ASICs. Uh, those of you who follow the concept of Bitcoin, you probably heard it you know, at the beginning. Everybody was using software, and now everybody are using FPGAs and ASICs and doing various things because they're more efficient when you look at money per time ratio. <laughs> at the end, the cryptanalytic problem, even though we will hide it very carefully, we will not tell it explicitly, is you have a budget of $1 million and you have to find the key in five days. This is the problem. It's not you have uh, tried to break the cipher in five days. You can always break the cipher in five days. Just buy a sufficient amount of machines to, pr to, to do the exhaustive search in five days. There is a physical limitation of the universe. Yeah. We are theoreticians. We don't care about that part of real life. Only about money. Hmm? <laughs> no. Yes. Um, the simultaneous evaluation of f on many points, is that completely generic technique or it depends on the f? It depends. f should be easy, should encounter, for example, for bit slicing, f should be most of the time, do not go through very high degree algebraic transformations at any given time. But if you can break it into several ones, it should work well. But it depends on the size of your registers in your machines. It depends on several other the number of registers that you have at your disposal and no, several other technical. The dependence on F, not on uh, the dependence on so it's, 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 it's usually it's usually not for any cryptanalytic purpose in block ciphers, F is not going to be the problem. Uh, now, just to give you a hint of how this works, um, when this was introduced, the main complaint was it has 56 bit keys. Now, if it has 56 bit keys, Exhaustive key search takes 2 to the 56 evaluations of this. Now, we can try and do counting 2 to the 56, so I think 1,001 million. The question is how much does it take? And I think the, the, the point of view of the community was 56 bits is too much for an academic or an average Joe, but for the NSA, Rumble, rumble, rumble. This is not a real problem. They can construct a dedicated machine that breaks the ES. And they went and they did the computations and they showed that they actually designed the machine with one million chips and you put them in 64 racks and they designed everything. You can see their paper. It's, by, by the way, a seminal paper in the sense that if you read it, you'll understand VLSI from the 70s. I mean, most of the paper is about how to identify when a chip fails. Did any of you thought that the chip can fail? <laughs> Unthinkable. Most of the work is about how to identify a failing chip. Today it will be about how to cool this entire thing. But back then it wasn't a problem. So they did their estimation, took in, into account the overhead of computing everything, and they said, okay, the machine will cost 20 million US dollars, and it will be able to find a single key, this key 
per day. Meaning you let this machine run for a day, it will find a single key, and now you can say, okay, this is something that the NSA can find. The average hacker not, but the NSA can find. And if you do the analysis, you actually start to feel something is a bit wrong here. Because we're not only afraid of hackers, but we're also afraid of people like the NSA, or if you go back to the 70s, the KGB. So, um, there was a competition between the cryptographic world and NIST, the National Institute of Standard and Technology, the guys representing NSA to the public, uh, sorry, uh, trying to standardize technology to the public with vectors. Um, and, they, and there was this argument saying 56 bits is not, is, not, is not enough, and from the other side NIST saying, no, 56 bits is a is huge amount of qubits. So at some point, uh, RSA Labs had enough, and they released a desk challenge, they put, a, put out a public, uh, in public a plain text and cipher text. The first one to bring the key, $10,000. And as you can guess, people, this is 97, so we already have SETI at home, distributed.net, all these uh, projects. And there was a project desk call, which found the key in 90 days. NIST said, well, 90 days, it's a lot of time, and we used 14,000 computers over the internet. Nobody can do that. So there was a second challenge. This time it took only 39 days. And NIST still said, well, 39 days, it's a lot of time, and a single key. And so at this point, uh, RSA released the third challenge, and it, Anybody heard of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF? Fighting for your digi digital rights even when it's a lost cause. It's not an official slogan? Okay. So they had enough. They just went and built an exhaustive search machine that took 22 hours to find the key. They went and constructed the machine, built it, ran it, and found the key. Did they say how much it cost? $250,000. Um, the interesting part is that machine could try 88 billion keys per second. That's a lot. It's 2 to the 36. And a full exhaustive search on a single machine would have, costed, uh, would have taken 9.5 days. Now, majority of the cost is actually design. And if, you're, if you've ever done ASIC design, you know that the first part is paying the engineer to do the design. Then you have to manufacture the prototype, and when it works, you go to mass production, and any additional unit costs less, significantly less. So you can easily build such machine. Um, if you assume more slow, actually, that is still correct, today uh, this machine would either, at the same, this price, you would either get 512 times increase in computational power, or you can construct the machine for $500. $500. Okay, more slow, and you know, we have to assume some things here. This is roughly uh, the situation. Uh, there are several other projects that show that this is actually the limit. The Copacabana, for example, did it on FPGAs. Um, and I, I think that at this point, you can all agree that 56 bits are not enough. Well, at least in 97 terms. We all agree? If you apply Moore's law, you will find out that actually also 64-bit key is insufficient for today's security. Um, and today, the standard approach is move to 80-bit security level. And this also helps if you need to ever design a, a protocol or a public crypto system and you try to evaluate how much effort we can do as script analysts trying to break your skin. 2 to the 80 is the minimal security level for real life security today. So you have to pick your parameters such that 2 to the 80 attack will not break your skin. Okay. Any questions? How do you expect to stay over with time? 2 to the 80, would it be too little in 10 years from now? Yes, there is a table by uh, NIST, there is also a table by uh, the European project Ecrypt 2, which is based on Ecrypt 1, which is based on Nessie, and there's, there's a table bar by Ariane Lenstra, 
and that predicts using Moore's law exactly how many bits. Add one bit for every year and a half. According to NIST, it should be at least 112 today, which is not 128. Well, if you look at what happens to Bitcoin, it's actually a very reasonable uh, extrapolation. And 80 bit is the minimal requirement. If you want real security, I would go with at least 128 bits or even more. But this is just my paranoia speaking. It's not like you have less than that. Nobody designs anything less. There is some lightweight constructions that do 80 bit security. Um, so I just mentioned earlier the Hopa Kobana, just to prove to you that you can use FPGAs. It's a project from 2007 that for 10,000 euros reached this uh, speed. You can do the comparisons and take into account the exchange rate, exchange rate in 2007, reduce the cost of PhD students and do the arithmetics. Uh, they also have Copacabana 2, and you can actually go and buy this thing online. Um, there are people also that used Sony PlayStation, uh, for those of you who heard of the MD5 attacks and the Rook certificate attacks and all the uh, noise that happened in uh, 2008 uh, by the Stevens, uh, Lenstra, the Vegger, and the entire group there. Uh, they, they succeeded to generate a false uh, certificate using MD5 collisions. They used Sony PlayStation 3s, and they reached, for $400, you get 170 million MD5 computations per second. It's not comparable comparing desk encryption and MD5 compression function call, but you can see that plus or minus the, the relations. And for example, if you take not the state of the art GPU card, you can reach uh, 1.6 giga MD, uh, MD5 computations per second for much less. So as you can see, the more advanced computation becomes, the more power or more power per dollar can be bought. Okay. Um, now, a small rant against script analysis. Uh, actually, it's a very old one. In, uh, in his work, uh, Viner showed that actually when you do this parallelization and you have many nodes, each of them using a different uh, search space and trying to do things in parallel, you actually also have communication overhead. And if you take into consideration the communication over it, and mostly the cost of the wires, because this is copper, gold, whatever you want to put in your system, you actually have to pay for that. And he showed that actually if you have a cryptanalytic attack, which uses N processes, each of them accessing a memory bank of size N, the Minimal amount of, uh, of wiring is uh, omega of n to the power of 3 over 2. It doesn't affect exhaustive search because exhaustive search doesn't access a huge memory bank. This is a plus. But for attacks that do access huge memory banks, you have to take this into consideration. So you have to be very careful when you do the analysis. OK. It's time to change the idea. If you lost me by now, this is time to wake up. We'll continue. In 1980, uh, Hellman uh, actually suggested the combination of exhaustive key search and the dictionary attack and the table attack. In exhaustive key search, you work very, very hard, but you use no memory. On the other hand, in the table attack, you use huge memory, and in the online phase, you just perform one memory access after a huge pre-computation. So you already bought a machine that does lots and lots and lots of computation, and then you throw it away and you just wait for one memory access. Sounds a bit inefficient, right? So the idea is how to balance this. So for the sake of the example, let's assume that the function that I'm trying to invert f is a permutation. For a block cipher, the function that we defined is not a permutation. It's a function, but I want to start the description with something simple. Let's assume it is a permutation. And not only that it is a permutation, that it is a single cycle permutation. All the points in the space, if you take f and apply to x1, you get x2. And then if you apply it again, you get x3, x4. And everything is in one huge cycle. 
And here is that very, very elegant solution. Pick one point at random. It doesn't matter everything in the same cycle. Now, we have here n points. So compute f of x1 square root of n times. So in this case, three times. And then store in the table x4 with x1. This is a chain starting at x1. You evaluate f on it, f on it, f on it. You reach the end point, which is x4. And you store in the table x4 with x1. Indexed by x4. What do you do with that? Nothing much. I continue. I take x4, compute the chain until x7. I store in the table x7 with x4. I continue the chain. x7 goes, back, goes forward, and we're going to end with x1. So my table is composed of endpoint start point, endpoint start point, endpoint start point. And I have square root n of these points. We all agree? Nobody disagrees, that's good. That means everybody is asleep. In the online phase, I'm giving a point. Y. And I have to find x such that f of x is equal to y. Now for us it's very easy, you know, it's like 7. But how do we find it in a Hellman attack? So look, I would be very happy to compute f minus 1. But there is a problem. If f minus 1 was easy to compute, I wouldn't need this entire structure of Hellman attacks. What I can, what I can compute efficiently? f. This is the only function I can compute, f. So let's start computing f of y we'll get to x9. Compute f of x9, we'll get to x1. <coughs> Do you remember where x1 appears? <coughs> it's an endpoint in the table. So what you do, you take the, the point that you got, you apply f to it until you reach an endpoint. When you reach an endpoint, you go to the table. And what does the table tell you? The start point. And what will happen if I will start applying f from the start point of the chain? I will find the pre-image. <coughs> Pre-computation, n. I have to apply f n times. Memory consumption, square root of n, n point start point. I divided it into square root of n chains. Each chain, I just need to store two points. Online time complexity. Square root of n, because I'm inside one chain. All I'm doing is that I'm saving this huge cycle and having a shortcut here. Questions? Is it probable that the product is always order of n? Memory and uh, time. If it's on a single uh, cycle, yes, you can do. If you have more memory, you can have shorter chains and store more chains. No, I ask, is it probable that you cannot do it with less, that the product is smaller than n? Uh, no, but you can prove that the pre computation is at least order of n. And I think, actually, I think that what you're asking was also is easy, to, easy to prove that the memory times the app online is at least n. Um, it's probably true. Okay, so this is the basic case where everything is a permutation on a single cycle. In real life, f is usually not a permutation and not on a single cycle. So let's start with the easy part. What happens if we don't have a single cycle? We have several cycles. So if I try to uh, write down the cycle structure of the permutation, I get several different disjoint cycles. What would you change in the attack? Nothing. All agree? What you do, you just take this cycle, you break it into chains of the same length. Sometimes you will have a bit shorter chains because you finish the cycle, and you have a leftover, which is okay. There are going to be cycles, if the length of the, of the cycle is less than square root of n, you don't need to store anything. 
in the online phase, take the point, start applying F forward. <coughs> After less than square root of n step, you're going to reach the starting point. So great, if I'm giving you F, which is a permutation, you can invert it, right? So let's try to work with uh, functions, because this is the case. And here is the solution. You take at random several starting points, let's say n starting points. You compute chains, again, chain, 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 endpoint, and I store in the table endpoint start with, endpoint start with. Now, I'm just going to introduce one more uh, notation, and, which, and this is covering. A table is set to cover a point if the point is on the chain, because these are the points that I can invert, points which I know how to get into and I know where they end in the chain. So if I have m starting points and the length of the chain is t, I would require m times t being order of n. But this concept fails. There are several problems when you switch from permutations to functions. The first of them, and the most important one, is the fact that we're going to get collisions here in the chains. Okay, so we've got collisions, who cares? Why a collision is a problem? You don't know the starting point. The start point I always know. X, let's say that x3, if you fly to it f, you get this one, and you fly f, you get this one, and then you get the value here, just before y2. You will still have a chain. And I will store endpoint and start point. I might have multiple endpoints, but that's okay. I will just go to all starting points. You can do the analysis. There are not going to be that many starting points. And I cover less points, as Blas said. Indeed, once these two chains merge, if you apply f and you get a value here, the rest of the chain is dead. It's not covered. I stored two memory cells. From the first one, I got a chain of t values. And from the second one, I got less. And the more I add points, or the longer the chains are, the probabilities of the probability of collisions is going to increase. And if you start with n starting points, and length of the chain is t, and n times t is n, you can check the analysis. You will not cover even uh, n to the power of, I think, 3 over 4 or something. You cannot win this game. You cannot cover even a constant fraction, fraction of the space, no matter how you choose the points. Because if you have a random function, the chains will merge. If you know the polar draw algorithm, this is exactly what you're using in polar draw algorithm, that the chains merge. If you don't know the polar draw algorithm, go and learn it. It's really cool. So this doesn't work. Um, there is another technical issue that if once you're starting with the random functions and not random permutations, you don't necessarily have a pre-image. But this is a technicality that most of the time is not so interesting. Um, so the solution El Hellman had was as follows. Oop. We're stuck with one function. What did you say about the pre-image? So why would you need to find the pre-image if it doesn't exist? Because in some attacks, finding the pre-image is a step in a higher function. In a higher, you're a subroutine and you need to invert something. And you cannot invert it. It's not invertible. Yeah, but you have to work all the way. I would be very happy to tell you in advance, I cannot invert this. Oh, I see. I, I wasted time trying to invert something with no pre-image. In any case, what Hellman suggested was actually using different tables. He called them flavors. And for each table, you do you use a slightly different f function. By using a slightly different f function, even if two chains from different flavors collide at some location, because you apply two different functions, fi and fj, there was a collision. 
they reached the same point, but one went that direction with Fi and one went to the other direction with Fj. <coughs> Collisions inside the, the, the same function, we cannot handle that. So the idea is, we're going to construct for each and every flavor of one, of two, we're going to pick m starting points. The length of the chain is going to be t. And what we need to make sure is that the total coverage, okay, well, so let's say we have t and flavors, not, if you do all the analysis, the optimal is having t flavors. I'm not going to defend this at the moment. So you need to make sure that m times t, which is the coverage of a single table, times t, which is the coverage of t tables, is equal to n, because I need to cover all the points. I need to be able to invert all points. And the online phase looks like this. You give me a point, and I try to apply f1 to it, t times until I reach an end point under f1, or that I fail. There is no end point. After t steps, I will not find an end point if the point is not covered by this table. So I will switch to the second table. <coughs> apply t times. If I find an end point, I go back to the start point and apply f2 all over again. f3, f4, t times. So the only time complexity For each point, I had to. For each point in each table, I went. I did t steps. I have t tables, t flavors. So the online time complexity is going to be t squared. The memory consumption well, I have t tables. In each of them, I, I store m chains. The chains are invariant to the length of the chain. The only thing you store for a chain, per chain is start point and end point. So the memory consumption is actually m, the number of chains, times t, because I have t flavors. And if you look into this attack, you actually get not a single attack, but a trade-off. You can show that this attack works For any amount of memory that you will give me, that you will define to me, here, you have 2 to the 32 memory. I will tell you, OK, uh, the search space is this size. I put here 2 to the 32, and I will tell you the online time complexity. You give me more memory, I reduce the time complexity. You give me less memory, the time complexity increases. Of course, there are points on the curve which are not very interesting. For example, if you will give me too little memory, the time complexity, the attack would work, by the way. The attack works even if you give me a single cell of memory. A single cell of memory means I can store one chain. Meaning, you give me a point, and I will, it has, this, is, this chain has to cover everything. OK, one memory cell is a bit too little, but what is the expected length of a chain that covers everything? Order of n. Well, again, there is no such chain. Meaning that I'm going to go in the online phase order of n steps. This is just like doing exhaustive search. So if you give, give too little memory, there is no point in the attack. If you give too much memory, it's just like the dictionary attack but you get the trade-off between all other points on the curve, which are t less than n, and m is less than n. You can see this also requires this much. You find the amount of memory, the attack is already here. Questions? Uh, it, it, does 
T depend on the number of cells you given? Sorry, what is that? T. T. Number of, uh, T. Number N and T are two parameters that you can choose as the as the attacker, as the adversary. And so because if you have uh, N cells, then, uh, then then you don't need T. T should be one. Yeah, you don't, you don't need anything. You can run the dictionary attack. If I'm giving you the amount of memory for dictionary attack, this attack would still work. But what's the point? You can just generate chains of length one, which is actually the dictionary attack when you take it to the extreme. You just generate it. All the chains of length one. You don't need flavors, you don't need anything. OK. Um, yes. Uh, what I see is probabilistic, so in the scale of probability that the input I give you doesn't are not in any of the chains, if you have. Well, if, of course, if it's not in any of the chains, then I cannot invert it. And now we have. probability that it's Yes. You know what the difference between a good question and an excellent question is, right? Mm -hmm. There is a slide. But before we continue, I just want to uh, mention one thing. People, can, when they first meet this idea of heaven and table, say, okay, let's add more chains. Let's make the chains longer. Why do you insist on stopping when M and T are in some values? Why, why shouldn't you add more points to the table? And here is the thumb rule that Hellman used, which is actually a very good one for the stopping rule. When you stop inc increasing the size of your table, let's assume that you have n chains of length t, and you want to add another chain. And Hellman said, the moment that the new chain is going to collide with any of the existing chains, the gain, the additional number of points that we can cover using this additional chain is not optimal. You expected to, to get t more points, but you got less. Now, there are t values here. There are m times t values here. So the stopping rule is that once m t, which is the size of this set, times t, which is the size of this set, is equal to n, each new chain is expected to generate collisions. And if it generates collisions, it's not useful. Or it's less useful than it should be. So this is the reason for the stopping rule. And you can see that because of that, we need T flavors. OK. Yes? It seems that there are many levels of freedom where you can try to optimize this algorithm. Has anyone tried to? Uh, hmm. Well, we will get there. It's an excellent question. Um, just a quick thing about if you're going to break block ciphers in comparison with trying to break hash functions with that technique. Um, if the block size and the key size are equal, then this is immediate uh, problem. The sizes are the same. You can see that I'm using the key space as the chain, as the block size. The key space defines the, the length of the point, so I can apply f on a point. If the sizes are incompatible, there are two things. If the key is shorter than the plain text, what you do, you take the encryption, and then you just remove some of the bits from the plain text, from the, from the cipher text. So when you apply f, if you use this function, in this you would expect output of 64 bits. For the next step, you need only 56 bits. Okay. So you need to define which bits you throw away. And this is another method of generating these flavors. Of course, there, might, there are some cases of false alarms. I didn't discuss these things. But because we are given functions, there is a chance, a chance that you start with a point here, you apply f to it, and you enter some chain randomly. Then you move forward, you reach the end point, you go back to the start point, and you start moving forward. But you didn't find the pre-image. So this is a false alarm. 
Tort Procellar, it happens for Hellman tables with probability of about 50%. So you expect in your search to find, you need to do the work twice of uh, finding the pre-image. And if the key length is significantly longer than the plaintext size, just concatenate the encryption of two predetermined plaintext, you might need to redo some bits here, but you can do it. Okay, now, you could be very happy with what I just presented, and then you go to a harder uh, designer and he'll tell you, look, 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 you promised me this trade-off curve, right? It's a wonderful trade-off curve. There's only one problem with it. Each time you compute f, you go to a huge memory bank. And I read Viner's paper and I know that this is a bad idea. We don't want to access the memory too much. If you say, well, memory access when it sits in level one or level two cache, it's very fast. That's true. But if you have a hard drive of four terabytes and you store the Hellman table somewhere on the hard drive, the sick time to find this specific chain on the hard drive is going to be significantly longer than one death evaluation. Could you give an estimation? It depends on your hard drive. Thunder. 100 milliseconds? <coughs> In 100 milliseconds, you can do at least 80,000 deaths <coughs> on a respectful computer. Like a machine with a terabyte RAM. Hmm? Use a machine with a terabyte RAM. Okay, so you do only 1,000 deaths. It's still a waste for each death instruction. Let's say we're discussing AS instructions. AS instruction, today you can do AS encryption in 61 cycles on a modern CPU. Accessing RAM does not take 61 cycles. It takes significantly long. So, what should we do? Um, solution by reverse, by the way, he never published it, so feel free to publish it under your name. Uh, his idea is as follows. Look, instead of making all the chains of the length of t, let's assume that the length of the chain is going to be a bit random, but on average it's going to be t. You will walk forward in the chain until you reach a point such that a few bits are set to zero. This is a distinguished point. All the endpoints must be of the form. The, the last, least significant, the last uh, few bits are set to zero. If you repeat the analysis, that, well, the hand waving analysis that I just did, you will see that if you fix that log two of t bits are set to zero, the coverages are the same, everything is the same, the online complexity is roughly the same, because if you start with a random point and you move forward until you hit this distinguished point. You do roughly order of t, there are some deviations, but nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed is the fact that unless you find this distinguished point, there is no point to look for it in the database, because it's not a distinguished point. All the chains must end with a point of the form that and that many bits are set to zero. So the number of f evaluations remains, the number of memory accesses reduces. There is another technicality, if the chain is too long, you, you, you just drop it. But because, you can, because it's a random function, you might walk forward and then not reach a, a distinguished point. You just say, you put some counter that says after sufficient amount of time, let's say four times t evaluations, if you didn't reach a distinguished point, throw it away. But again, this is a small technicality. Okay, some analysis, um, it doesn't change anything and uh, it was shown that it's actually very useful if you try to build a parallel machine that tries to do that. Because each CPU does its own chain, works a lot, works a lot, works a lot, and once every t applications of the function f issues an access to the memory bank. Okay, and you might have heard of the rainbow tables. An idea by Oshlin, and Oshlin was trying to reduce the number of false alarms, and his idea is as follows. Take all these flavors and throw them away. It's, having different tables with different flavors, it, it causes a headache. 
Now try to explain this concept to hardware engineers, you find yourself in a problem. What you do, you start with M starting points, you apply on all of them F1. And then F2, and then F3, and then, uh, and then Ft, until you reach an endpoint. So instead of having different flavors, you multiplex them. You put them like a set of transparencies. You first apply F1, then F2, then F3, until you reach Ft. And why this is such a wonderful idea? Well, the thing is, if I'm giving you an endpoint, if I'm giving you a point, you first apply Ft. And you go and search in the table whether Ft of this point is an endpoint. And if this is not the case, you apply Ft minus 1, Ft. So by, by applying once Ft, I'm checking, checking whether this y is in this column. When I have Ft minus 1, Ft, I'm checking whether this point is in the second column. Third column, fourth column, etc. And we already solved the problem of collisions between different chains, because if the value here is equal to the value here, who cares? This goes through F2 and this goes through F3. But what about the same column? In the same column, you, you pick the parameters that there will not be that many collisions, and you can weed them out very easily. And the claim is that actually you save a factor of two in the number of F evaluations. Yes? Why do you need distinguished points here? Here we don't need distinguished points. Why? Uh, because you always know that the last application is going to be FT. You start by applying FT. And then you search whether it's, a, it's an endpoint. <laughs> then you apply FT minus one FT. You always apply FT and then go to check in the database. And the number of evaluations of FT, if you count of F, if you count correctly the, the series, it's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. It's actually t squared over 2. So you save the factor of 2 in the online time complexity. And then you get this nice curve. n squared equals to 2 tm squared. Now, I know that for some of you, dealing with constants is not as exciting as for some others. Um, however, Constants are very, very important, as you can probably know in real life. So, uh, you do get this curve, but the analysis of uh, Barkhan, Biam, and Shamir from 2006 actually showed that you lose by using rainbow tables. And the reason for that is that various optimization techniques that we can do in Hellman tables, I didn't get into all the optimizations you can do. For example, you don't pick random points, you just pick 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you don't need to store parts of the start point. The start point is much shorter. The information about the start point is significantly shorter. So I can save some memory there. There are techniques to save memory on the end point. There are several techniques. And if you apply everything, you actually find out that um, you cannot apply these techniques for rainbow tables, and you lose. In the grand scheme of lives, you lose. Now, I was asked about random, uh, the success rate, and, well... Or? Yes. Sorry, just, uh, so what, what do you make of the, the claim in the Rainbow Table paper is that, I mean, I've seen the, the, the argument in the BBS paper, so the claim in the Rainbow Table paper is that they actually empirically ran the attack and compared it to, uh, uh, and, and claimed it at a high success rate. So why, why oh. if, if it's more expensive, then why, what's the base of that claim, or it's just not accurate in your opinion? You know, I'm the best um, sniper in the world. However, I define the world as the people standing in this square. And I, I will discuss this. This is the key element. It relates to the success rate. The real coverage of Hellman table, if you look, I have your m chains of length t, I would expect empty values. Hellman showed also empirically that you receive about 80% of empty. Uh, if you assume that all these tables are independent, the probability of success of a Hellman time memory trade of attack 
to invert a point is 55%. Um, there are lots of works about finding optimal tables and coverage. For example, you store all the tables and if you see merging uh, chains, you throw some chains and you improve things and you do wonderful things. Uh, you don't get much above 70-something uh, percent. Not that this matter, but this is roughly what you can get. Rainbow tables have success rates of 99%. And the reason is that there are no false alarms, there are no cases where you go into a chain and you don't reach an endpoint, and every, everybody are very happy, and just you just ask how come they can succeed with 99% with the same amount of memory and they're just solving a different problem. The 99% is for um, inverting passwords. Finding cryptographic keys, it's very different. Now, you can define the problem of applying hash function on some input as a general purpose. Uh, you know. The function that we defined earlier can be the inversion of the hash function. But if the spaces are aligned correctly, rainbow table can reach 100%. Well, Almost 100%. And the thing is, their performance figures are for a slightly different problem, not key inversion. Not, sorry, not password inversion. Sorry, again. I need the man in black stick that makes you forget the last five seconds. It's not for key inversion, it's for finding passwords. And for finding passwords, Hellman, due to several issues, especially because you need to reduce spaces when you move between spaces which are not the same size, there are some artifacts. And there is where you lose. Now... Can you give the intuition why it works better with a password? Because the, the number of false alarms is reduced. Because the spaces are easier to manipulate. Rainbow tables do not need to manipulate the spaces in the same way Hellman needs. Hellman needs to reduce long strings into shorter ones. So you throw some bits. So you get collisions not in the merging, so you get more probability of merging into a chain. You get into a chain that you, 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 is not covered, does not cover the point that you're trying to invert. When you don't do this trick, for example, when you have hash functions, you just apply the hash on any size of the input, who cares? So there are small technicalities there. In any case, there is a theoretical proof that says that the online time complexity um, is larger than n squared over this wonderful constant, saying that up to a logarithmic factor, Hellman table uh, is the best option if you assume that f is random. And if you assume that f is not random, there is an or Jung paper that shows that you can reach the curve tm to the power of 3 n to the power of 3 for any function. So we don't have that much time, and we need to get to the interesting stuff. Uh, I will just skip time memory data trade-off. I will just mention the fact that sometimes we get several data points, meaning I'm asking you to invert the function. Here is y1, which is f of x1, y2 of f of x2, y3 of f of x3, and et cetera, et cetera. And I want to find one of the pre-images. For example, a bank is using several different keys for encryption. And if you succeed to find one single key, you hit the jackpot. You don't need to find all the keys. So in this case, uh, this case is actually more suitable for stream ciphers, but in any case, going very quickly to the results, this is the curve. n squared is equal to time, memory squared, data squared. So the more data points that you give me, the easier it becomes. And Quite a lot of discussions about how to do it. Questions about questions about time memory traders. So if I give you a chip of memory, you will give me some time. Or time for memory chips. Okay. So 56 bits of DS. It's a very problematic uh, issue because 56 bits you can build a huge machine that finds keys in 20 million US dollars or what have you. And this is insecure. So how do we secure the internet with this? By the way, the answer is no, you don't secure the internet with this. But <laughs> let's assume for a second that you are forced to secure the internet with this. 
some people say yes. Um, here's an idea, you know what? Instead of encrypting only one time using this, let's encrypt twice, okay? That's under one key and that's under a second key. Sounds okay? Two keys. The amount of entropy in the key, 112 bits. That's two to the 112, even today, if you take uh, Arian Lenster's uh, paper, it's sufficiently good. Everybody are happy? Someone is happy? <laughs> okay, so you all know where, it, where we're heading to. This is the meet in the middle attack. Hmm? Yeah, but they're not paying me $10 million like RSA, so I'm not happy. And I'm here. So, let's assume that you indeed try to encrypt twice with this under two different keys, K2 and K1. So you first encrypt P under the first key, and then you encrypt it under the second key. And this looks like a wonderful solution besides the following fact. If I rewrite this, this equation as this, I just decrypt it under K2, both uh, hand sides, uh, both sides, sorry. You will see that now each side depends only on 56 qubits. <laughs> Instead of an equation that requires 112 bits to evaluate, now I need 56 bits to evaluate this one, 56 bits to evaluate this part. And because everybody knows what's going to happen now, you take the P1, you encrypt it under all possible 2 to the 56 K1s, you get the value here, you store them in a table, index by this value, from the bottom half, you take C1, you decrypt it under all possible K2s. For each K2, you compute XK2, and you go and check whether this value is in the table. If it's not in the table, then no matter what happened here, there is no K1 that will enable the decryption of C1 to P1, meaning that K2 is wrong. And if by any chance you find a value in the table, that means that C1 was encrypted to XK2, which happens to be XK1. The value here is X. This common value is going to be XK1 or XK2. It doesn't matter how you computed it. But you found the same value from two sides. And of course, give me more memory. Well, if you give me enough memory to store the table, everybody are happy. The time complexity is 2 to the 56 evaluation that side, 2 to the 56 evaluation that side. For each collision, there is a small technicality. Those of you who remember Shannon would complain that unicity distance, uh, you, you find a single key of 112 bits using 64 bit data, you're cheating us. Yes, I'm cheating you a bit. Uh, there is an additional check that you need to use a second paintext and ciphertext pair, but the amount of paintext and ciphertext pair that go to the second evaluation is only 2 to the 48, which is significantly lower than 2 to the 56. And you can see that the attack requires 2 to the 56 memory, 2 to the 57 desencryptions, 2 to the 48 the second phase, nobody cares about. If you give me less memory, not a problem. I will construct the table, I will fill it to the brim from one side, and then try all possible K2s. If I will fail, I will remove all the values from the table, take another chunk of K1s, generate the table, and you get actually the curve times time memory equals to 2 to 112, 2 to the 112. So let's say you have 32 bits, 2 to the 32 memory. That means double this gives you 2 to the 80 time. This is the amount of time you need to do in order to break this. And I, just, I just want to mention one thing. Uh, this is actually a collision between two functions. And we can do without memory. There are algorithms for finding collisions with no additional memory. I mentioned Polar Pro earlier. So you can do Polar Pro here as well. The cost of finding a collision here would be about 2 to the 32. Let's do the quick and dirty analysis. And it will be a random collision. And we need to go over all possible collisions. So actually, by just Applying the same meet in the middle approach, but for finding collisions between two different, two different functions, there is a wonderful paper by uh, Van Oshut and Weiner 
that shows that you can do it in about 2 to the 88 with no additional memory. Meaning, the extra memory doesn't add to that much. Though, of course, if you give me more memory, the time complexity is going to reduce. Um, okay, one and bits is not sufficient. Triple this. We all seem very excited and tired. Yeah. Not that I'm aware of, but you know, in, uh, I think it's in Utah or in or where they build this new uh, thing with electricity issues. I'm sure they have the ability to do that. So according to in Israel, you say according to foreign sources. Uh, what was the question? If somebody ever implemented meet in the middle attack on double this, and according to foreign sources, uh, someone has. Um, you can do the same thing with uh, triple this. You guess one key, you construct the table from one side, you decrypt backwards under two keys, the time complexity of the attack, 2 to the 112, memory 2 to the 56, and of course, there is a full trade-off here. There are a few works that actually improve this. Uh, for the specific case of this, because of the constants and everything, when the block size, uh, etc., there is a logarithmic gain. I'm not going to get into this. Uh, Stefan Lux from FSC 98. He has some small logarithmic gains because there are collisions in these random functions. In, in exchange for huge data increase, you re reduce the, data, the time complexity by a factor of 16. Yes? So isn't that good enough, triple death, for securing the internet? Yes, but it's slow. But very, very slow. What's slow? The, the implementation of triple death. So, I see. And it was designed by the NSA from the same people who brought you dual EC. And the block size is too small today. Hmm? The block and the block size is too small, and, 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 and... No, but security-wise, I mean... Oh, block security. size for security, after 2 to the 32, oh, okay. that you will have problems with anyway. <laughs> yeah, you, okay. you might want to know that the banking industry Still switched to, to triple days in 2007. Yeah, from, from, from single what? days. From from single days. days. <laughs> yes, there was a huge <laughs> increase in, in, in security. Okay. Yes, triple death is still here. Let's conclude this discussion. Triple death is still here, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, triple death gives you 112 bit security. Let's use 112 bit key. This under K1, of this under K2, of this under K1. This is triple encryption with two keys. And it was conjectured to offer you 112 bits of security, because if you do meet in the middle, you construct the table from one side, and from the other side you have to guess two keys in order to find the collision in the table, which takes to the 112, which is what you would expect from a 112 bits key, right? So, there's actually a chosen plain text attack uh, by um, Merkel and Hellman. What they did is just said, okay, let's assume that the value here at this point is zero. Ask for its decrypted, personally, you do this computation at home under all possible K1s, you get P. Then you ask the, the person you're attacking to encrypt P under a chosen plaintext scenario. So it gives you C. And if it gives you C, this corresponds to some P. You ask the decryption of this P, right? You. You ask for the decryption of this P, right? How did you get to this P? You took, you took zero and you decrypted it under K1, meaning this P is related to K1 somehow. Meaning the ciphertext C is related to this K1. Meaning, ah, just take this C and partially decrypt it through this K1. And now you have a table going from zero here under all possible K1s until this point. And now you can construct a table going from this zero under all possible K2s until you 
meet in the middle, but in a slightly different middle. Data complexity 2 to the 56, time complexity 2 to the 56, memory complexity 2 to the 56, and there are trade-offs, and you can do wonderful things. What is the role of the inversion in the middle? Ah, um, I never mentioned it, but in triple desk you always encrypt, decrypt, encrypt. It doesn't change the security, but it allows you backward compatibility with single encryption, because if you put in the same key, you just got the key. Okay, we have five minutes for really uh, fun topic. Three encryption is not enough. Let's move into four. How do we break four? What's the problem? Meet in the middle. You know, you see, you guess, you take two to the. Let's assume for a second that the size, the sizes are the same. You take two to the n. Sorry, you take four plain text. Two to the n k one. Two to the n k two. No, let's say 64. So 2 to the 128 possible values for k1 and k2. You construct the values here. You take 2 to the 128 <coughs> values of k3 and k4. You go backwards, then you have meet in the middle. Everybody are happy? OK. Let me rearrange this uh, meet in the middle attack, what we will do. Let's assume that instead of guessing k1 and k2, Simultaneously, I'm going to guess this value, x12. This is just like guessing one key. Now, what happens when I have this value? I'll just run a bit in the middle attack here. You will get, for this specific x value, 2 to the n keys which are consistent with the encryption of p1 going to this x. And you find these 2 to the n candidate keys in complexity 2 to the n. This is a standard meet in the middle attack. OK. So I have this list of 2 to the n, k1, k2. Now, I will take the second plain text, and I will encrypt it under 2 to the n, but go back. You saw the punchline, which is already in the slide, so. OK. So now, you take the second plain text, you encrypt it under 2 to the n values. This takes 2 to the n time. We do the same here. We get 2 to the n candidates for k3 and k4, which allows me to have now 2 to the n candidates here. I have 2 to the n candidates here, 2 to the n candidates here. I can just do meet in the middle. And I will find remaining 2 to the n candidates, which I will further check with. Uh, I, I usually cheat in my lectures, not here, that time complex analysis is correct. So. You see, there are 2 to the n values here. This takes 2 to the n. I get 2 to the n candidates, so this takes 2 to the n. This takes 2 to the n. This takes 2 to the n. Everything is additive. Also the memory, so there is a small logarithmic factor that takes her away, but you are here, right? Nobody cares. And actually, we have this pincer movement, which allows me to find candidates in time 2 to the 2n and memory 2 to the n. So two to the, if everything was 64 bits, I would be able to break 4 encryption in 2 to the 128 time and 2 to the 64 memory. So the improvement from the double desk is in the memory, not in the time? It's, it's the same as triple desk. Breaking 4 desks Modulo some small differences because there the key size and the block size are not the same, so you need to do a bit extra work. Breaking four deaths, you can do it just like when you break three deaths, a triple death, um, at some point on the curve. The curve here is slightly different. Okay, we get time, time two to the end, and uh, everybody should be very happy. I'm telling you, be happy. Okay, hey, good, you're happy. So, let's try to extend this attack, and I'm going to show very quickly several ideas how to gain more. Let's assume that somebody heard that four encryption is just like three encryption, and we want more security. What should we do? Five encryption. Can you attack five encryption faster? Of course. Just guess the last key and apply the previous attack. <coughs> So the gain remains the same. 
We save 2 to the 64 in the memory complexity, and that's it, which is very nice, but can we save more? Switch to Gecko. Um, not enough Americans in the audience. Okay, so here is a very straightforward uh, improvement. I'm just going to go very quickly because we have minus one minute. Here is the idea. Guess two values after four steps. For each of these, four, for each of these uh, values after four rounds, you guess one value here. You run the meet in the middle phase here. You run the meet in the middle phase here. You get two to the n candidates here, two to the n candidates here. You run another meet in the middle here, two to the n candidates. So you can encrypt P3 to P8. You do the same here. And if you count very carefully, for each, these are the values that you guess. For each of these four values, you had to run the attack. Each of these errors cost two to the n encryptions. And so it requires two to the n memory. So if you started with saving of two to the sixty-four in memory, wise, if you really again assuming everything is sixty-four bits, this attack would require two to the one hundred twenty-eight times less memory than the comparable standard meet in the middle. This is the log layer algorithm, and if you have sixteen rounds. You just guess three values here, one value, two values, one value. If you have 32, it's just, we all know what logarithm is, right? At this point, I can't convince you everything, right? Who wants to give me a kidney? I have three. That's doesn't work. OK. So I'm going to say gain, uh, the gain sequence is where I actually gain something more than I would get in standard meet in the middle attack. There is another attack, which is the square algorithm. Let's say that we have 16 rounds. Here you guess 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. So if I have three values here, I can run the meet in the middle attack, the four rounds, the four meet in the middle attack we saw earlier. It takes 2 to the 2 n time, leaves 2 to the n keys. I can do it each and every in each of these locations. You can see that the total time complexity is going to be. One, two, three, four, nine, nine plus two. So this is going two to the eleven n. But at each time, at each point, I get two to the n keys here, two to the n keys, two to the n keys here, two to the n keys here, which looks awfully suspicious. This reminds me of um, quadruple encryption. You have two to the n keys here, 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 here. You just run the attack again. One level on top, and the gain sequence is much better, though there is the places where you gain. Earlier it was uh, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Here you gain at 2, 4, 9, 12, it's a technicality, 16, 25, 36, etc., etc. This actually gives you a much better gain. And I just uh, point to the fact that actually, if you look at these algorithms, all these algorithms treated both sides equally. This is the side generating the table, this is the side accessing the table. This is the side generating the table, this is the side accessing the table. By the way, whoever needed the color coding. Generate table, access the, code, the table. But when you access the table, you don't need to store anything. If you access the table more times, you didn't increase the data the memory complexity. So if, for example, instead of breaking it evenly and there's a way that we like to think of it, everything should be symmetric, and you know this is symmetric in cryptography after all, so everything should be symmetric. If you break it asymmetrically, let's say we guess two values here, we run the three triple <coughs> encryption attack here and the quadruple encryption attack here. <coughs> Okay, this will take 2 to the 2n time. It will leave me with 2 to the n keys, which remain. So I will build a table with 2 to the n values here. Now, I will run the same 2 to the 2n attack here. It will leave me 2 to the 2n keys. 
So what? I will take these two to the end keys and I will go back with them into the table. And by breaking it unevenly, the time complexity, as you can see, didn't change. It doesn't change. It was for every guess of these two values, I had two to the two and here, two to the two and here. And the additional memory access, who cares? It's two to the two n. And the gain sequence is sufficiently uh, better, or significantly better, actually. Uh, I'm not going to discuss how to combine this with the meeting the middle based on, with no memory, based on uh, Floyd, uh, based on memoryless collision finding. I will just convince you that if you look at the gains that you gain from square and log layer, square is significantly better. If you use dissection, you can see that it's significantly better than meeting the middle. This is in comparison to meeting the middle. If you use the parallel collision search, which is, which is the method of doing it with no memory, or with little memory, you will see that at some point, a parallel collision search catches on dissection, but if you combine the two, you get a very nice game. Now, you can ask me, who the hell wants to encrypt 42 encryption of death? <laughs> Which is a wonderful question, and you're correct, nobody is using 42 encryption, not even triple encryption, for that matter. But you can use the same attack for many algebraic and combinatoric uh, algorithms, for example, for solving knapsacks or solving Rubik's cubes, or other very interesting problems. So this is actually a very uh, nice result. Thank you for your